So um, we're getting into the middle of the summer, at least that's how it feels uh, for some of the people who have uh, children in school. And many of us have already gone on family reunions and attended family weddings and gone to some gatherings. I must report I have not received any pictures of those events, but I know they're coming. A couple have been promised. And I just encourage you to take the opportunity um, to, if you attend a, a large family gathering, just to share a photo with us. I'll make sure it gets back to you. Um, and if you won't have one from this year, feel free to share one from the past. I'm trying to um, unearth the one from my aunt's 60th wedding anniversary. Um, and, and so um, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that we'll see some pictures and we could see more about our extended families and that'd be one more way for us to get a peek into each other's lives. But, but I have some really good news. You heard a little bit about it um, during the announcements and that is um, you are all invited to participate in a big church-wide picture on August 13th. Um, it's going to be an exciting day because, the, as um, Chris was telling you, the youth are going to lead worship and tell us about their mission trip. Um, the children are going to be promoted, and we're going to have blessing of the backpacks. And we, th I thought, um, and, and it was wonderfully confirmed by staff, that it would be a great day um, just to celebrate our unity. And, and so we're going to have a, a family reunion of sorts by taking this picture. And so, um, you know, it's my goal to have a minimum of 200 people here. Um, and, and what we're going to do is um, take the picture between the two services. So if you're here at the 9, I'm going to invite you to just to pause a little bit longer. And I'm going to invite the people from the 1015 service maybe to get here a little sooner. And then we're going to gather and we'll have our picture taken. Um, and, and the good news is Carrie, our communications director, has assured me it won't be perfect. And so then it'll look like us. And so, <laughs> and so I'm pretty excited about that, but um, I, I really hope that you will take the challenge that I am about to offer seriously. Um, it would be awesome if each person sitting in the pew today would invite someone who used to come, comes here regularly, has been at the lake, um, for whatever reason is having transportation problems, invite them to come and be present for our, our church photo. and, and you know, if you need to invite them to um, come by offering them a ride, or if you need to just call and remind them, you know, I know that Saturdays get busy. I'm just going to call you Saturday afternoon around 5 and, and remind you that the photo's the next day. But let's all be intentional about inviting those who we miss to come and participate um, in that picture. And so I got to thinking about all the wonderful and inc incredible things we could do if we start looking at that picture once it's taken and, and processed, but we start looking at that picture and see all the people who are present. And, and it'll give us an idea of all the people who still need to be here and all the people that we still need to invite. And if we hold that before ourselves, then we will keep remembering about God's call and claim upon us, and that's we be part of what God is doing in the world, and that's inviting others to come to know God. So that's my hope, that's my dream, and you will be hearing about it on a regular basis between now and then, and that's the good news. Um, but this, so that got me to thinking about these stories that we've been reading about Abraham and this family, this family that you know God promised would be more numerous than the stars in the sky, and this family that would be the family that led God's holy people in, 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 in the, um, the, the Israelite nation. And, and, if you really start paying attention, there's only about 50 people that have been mentioned. Now, the chroniclers, those who wrote down the history, um, were writing in their own particular point in time, which meant you count all the men, <laughs> and a, a couple of women's names are mentioned, um, and you certainly list all the boy, the progeny, um, but, but you don't count the women. So, so if they counted 50, you know, we would probably say that Abraham had at least 100 people in his sphere of uh, his uh, family. So, but let's get back to that 50 number. If you just take a moment and think about the 50 family members that are closest to you, like think about your 
50 members fear of family. Think about the things that God has done in them and through them. Think about the things that you're praying for God to still do in them and through them. But think about that group of people as we think about also our church and, and what an impact a group of people can have upon their community and upon their world if they work together like those gears have to be connected in order um, for everything to start spinning. How it would be if we as a faith community um, work together to do the work that God is calling us, not another church down the block here or up the road there or around the corner there, but if what God is calling us to do for our community and our city and our state and our nation. And, and if we start thinking in terms of, of that claim and that call and, and start looking at ourselves as that group of people, that, that sphere of people that are closest to us that can make some of that stuff happen, I think that we will see that God is most ably at work in and through us and can do some amazing things through this faith community. So I'm going to just invite you to keep thinking about that, keep thinking about the people who are closest to you in your own family, how you might impact them um, on behalf of the Lord and, and, and how as a faith community we can impact the greater community because that's what Abraham's life was all about. He was chosen by God to go to that place that he did not know. And when he went to that place, God promised him a child. It took a really long time. And they had that child, and that child was Isaac. But they couldn't wait. So before that child, they had Ishmael through uh, Hagar, the Egyptian slave. And, and, and then we found out, um, if you read consecutively up into the place where I picked up again today, that when Sarah died, Amazing as it may be to all of us, Abraham married again and with Keturah had six more sons. And so he had two before and, and six after that we are aware of. Um, but this pattern of sending his children away did not stop with Ishmael. Uh, he did that to protect that, that special place that Isaac was supposed to have and um, or um, at least he believed that that was necessary. And, and he actually did that with Keturah's sons as well. And so when we read through history, we read very little about Ishmael other than Ishmael did have uh, sons. And upon his death, they didn't get along. And then when we, when we read further about after Abraham's passing, the only one who received any of the inheritance was Isaac. And, you know, this is the perfect groundwork for sibling rivalry. This is the perfect groundwork for discord and, and a lack of harmony, not only within a family system, but within the larger community. And each one of those sons kind of learned how to behave that way. Um, and, and so when it comes to the time when Isaac um, is about to have a child, um, they have some difficulty with infertility that goes on for quite some time. And, and while she, Rebecca is pregnant, she's feeling all this, you know, fussing and feuding in her, in her stomach. And she asks God, and God tells her right then and there that she will um, be bearing um, two nations, the, the, the leaders of two nations. And they come out, and one is red, and one... Um, is grasping the heel, and, and, and the sibling rivalry began <laughs> that moment, although we do hear that it was happening before. But, but what I've always been <clears throat> interested in is that, that God told Rebecca while they were still in the womb that the younger would be the one to lead the older one, the, the firstborn. And, you know, we, with twins, there's not a whole lot of time, but there is something very... Um, set in Semitic um, ancestry, and, and that is that the oldest child gets a double portion. And so it was a big deal to be born first. And for that firstbornness um, to be somehow messed with would have been somewhat disturbing to the people in their community. And, and Esau just gave away his birthright for a, a bowl of stew because he was hungry. And, and then later, um, there's a, a further story in which Rebecca tr tricks the then blind Isaac um, and puts fur on, on Jacob's very um, smooth skin so that Isaac would think that it was Esau and Isaac gave him the blessing 
and that blessing couldn't be taken back when he realized he had been tricked. And yet we read that God, Genesis 25.5, um, God blessed Isaac. And all this family fussing and carrying on from before he was born and all through his life, and God is blessing, and we're wondering what God's doing. I've been wondering what God's doing. And, and I wonder how God is it, you know, it seems like God set up a situation in, there in which there'd be more sibling rivalry. You know, he's saying to Rebecca that the younger one is going to be ruling over the older one, and we know that's not going to go well. Societally, that's not the way it's supposed to, do, to go. We see over and over again through our faith ancestors that it's not the people that we would choose to lead or the people that we would choose um, to, to do a special thing. It's, it, it's sometimes the one that we would choose last. And yet that is who God uses to bring about God's purposes. And that God over and over again shows us that God is not bound by conventional societal conventions or, or the cultural norms of the day. God is bound by God's desire to bring about God's purposes. And that's what God was doing through Isaac and through Jacob. Um, Jacob goes on to have 12 sons, and those 12 sons are the original 12 tribes of Israel. And, and they go on to lead our faith ancestry to the time in which um, Christ came. And, and it was out of Jacob's 12 progeny that um, Jesus' ancestry is. And so we look at God and, and we wonder, what is God doing? And, and we wonder, how is it that God is always choosing the person that we would least likely choose on our own? And, and we open ourselves to the understanding that, that it's not so much about what we think, it's about what God is desiring and what God is trying to have happen in the world. And sometimes God's purposes don't seem to line up with our purposes, and sometimes that causes us some angst, and sometimes it causes us a whole lot of confusion. But the truth is, it always brings us to a place in, in which we have to get in conversation with God about what it is God would have us do. And, and we see that over and over again, that the people became faithful. And, and, and Isaac did um, continue to lead his family. And, and Jacob did have to wrestle with God one night into the future. But um, Jacob then became called Israel, and he led his people in a way that would lead us further in our understanding of who God is and who God created us to be and who God is calling us um, to be with others. And we have an important lesson um, to continue to be learning through our faith ancestors. Because so often we want to grab a hold of what we want to get done for the church, what we want to get done for the world. And what we really need to be doing is listening to what God would have us do. And when we start listening to what God's purpose is, not only for um, the bigger community are, but for our lives and how we can participate in God's work, then we start getting in that tune of, of gee, the least likely person is being <laughs> chosen to do this hard work. Because over and over again, you hear it in your, hear, in your ear and you feel it in your heart that God's calling you to do this thing that's not comfortable and you're not sure you have the ability. And, 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 and I will tell you that when you feel, um, our former youth director, Jay Wiesner, used to say, um, ad, nause, ad nauseum, you know, when you really feel sick to your stomach, you'll know that's pretty much where God wants you to go. Um, it, it's that place that pushes you out of that comfort zone that, that seems to be the normal pace of your life and, and invites you into this new way of being that God is calling each one of us to journey upon. We need to be open to what God is doing. Abraham needed to be open to what God was doing in the world. When God said go, he went. When, when it came time for Isaac to come down from the mountain in which his father had pretty much terrified him. You know, he didn't go back to the place where he had been. He went to this new place to establish this new life. And in this new life, he himself encountered God. And in that encounter with God, in his coming to claim God for himself, he was able to do and to be who God had formed him to be. And so it is with his sons. For Jacob would be the one that God chose 
defying all human, sociological, and cultural logic, God had, had a purpose for Jacob's life that led Jacob to do what God wanted God to do. Each one of us has a purpose for our life. Each one of us is called to claim that purpose and to listen to where God would have us go and to follow along that path. We, um, sometimes it feels like um, God is too close for our comfort. Sometimes when we feel that nudging, sometimes when we feel that, hear that little voice in the back of our head, sometimes when our friends keep saying the answer to those things that we really didn't want to hear said in that way, over and over we think, no, that's a little bit too close for me to feel comfortable today. And over and over again, God reaches out and assures us that God does have a purpose for our lives, that God will be with us and walk with us as we are fulfilling God's purposes. And as we fulfill God's purposes, we need to be thinking about how those purposes will help God continue what God is doing in the world. I am prayerful, and I am hopeful, and, and I am confident that God has um, an incredible journey before us um, in this next year and five and ten years down the road, that, that we are only just coming into <laughs> our young adolescence as a faith community. In our young adolescence, we, we're coming to understand that together we can do far more than any one of us can do alone and that God can do far more than any of us can imagine. And with our willingness to follow, God can show us what God can accomplish. Your challenge for the week is to notice how God is working in your life. How is God using you? And to share that with someone who needs to hear it.